problem. Here we have a ball that is thrown vertically downwards to the ground as illustrated in this figure. We can see that there is a ball is thrown down with a speed of 8.7 meters per second is when it hits the ground, right? And this initial speed is just u. It covers a distance of 1.5 meters before it comes to a rest on the ground. So the ball is thrown with speed u from a height 1.5 meters. The ball then hits the ground with speed 8.7 meters per second. Assume that the air resistance is negligible. Uh, calculate speed u. So just for the sake of it, when they say air resistance is negligible, it just means that because air is made up of molecules and atoms, right? But because they're so small, these molecules and atoms, you cannot see them. But it doesn't mean that the air is just empty space. There are these very tiny little molecules. And if a ball falls through these molecules, what will happen is it will collide with these all of the molecules and that, that is what we call the air resistance because this these molecules are resisting the downward motion of the ball, right? So that's air resistance, but they're saying that we can just ignore uh, this air resistance and then compute the speed u. Now that's pretty straightforward as well because we have the final speed, we have the acceleration, which is basically just due to gravity, and we have the distance that is covering, which is 1.5 meters before it comes to before it comes to this final speed, which is 8.7 meters per second. So we can use Newton's uh, equations of motion that relates these quantities, and we need to find v i, right? So there is an equation that relates all of these quantities, which goes like the difference between the final squared velocity and the initial squared velocity is equal to two times the acceleration times the displacement covered. So the final velocity is just 8.7 squared minus vi squared is equal to 2 into 9.81, which is acceleration due to gravity, and s is the distance that it's covering, 1.5 meters. Now rearrange this equation for vi and square root uh, the answer. So if you get, if you compute vi squared, if you do this part and divide it, uh, sorry, if you bring this over here, then this gives you 46.3. Right? And then you square root this thing. So vi is just the square root of 46.3. And this gives you the initial speed in meters per second as 6.80 meters per second. So the ball was initially thrown with the speed of 6.80 meters per second. Next part says that state how Newton's third law applies to the collision between the ball and the ground. Right. Now, what is Newton's third law? Newton's third law basically states that every action, for every action, there is going to be an equal but opposite reaction force. Right. But you have to remember the very important point is that these action and reaction forces are happening both on different objects. Right. So, which means that the force which is exerted by the ball on the ground when it hits this ground is of the same magnitude as the force exerted by the ground on this ball, right? But they act in opposite directions because obviously this is the force exerted by the ball on ground and the ground exerts a force in this direction. They're equal, but they're opposite in directions for the same time interval of the collision, right? When it is colliding with the ground. So that's how basically Newton's third law applies to this collision. So you can say something like that the force exerted by the ground or we'll start with the ball on ground is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the force exerted by ground on the ball right and this is only true for this interval of collision for that small interval that time that it collides uh, with the ground because when it does that and uh, in our problem uh, the ball stays at the ground but what would what could happen afterward is that the ball would start bouncing back up so it is only uh, this thing is happening for same time interval of collision.
The next part says that the ball is in contact with the ground for a time of 0.091 seconds. The ball rebounds vertically and leaves the ground with the speed of 5.4 meters per second. So now we see that indeed it is in contact with the ground for this small amount of time and then it rebounds or bounces back up with the speed 5.4 meters uh, per second. And the mass of the ball is also specified as 0.59 kilograms, right? And the problem statement is that calculate the magnitude of the change in momentum of the ball during the collision. So we want to figure out the change in momentum uh, that happens during this collision. So how do we figure that out? So it's pretty straightforward because remember change in any quantity is the difference between its final and initial value. So mass in momentum is a constant that never changes. So the difference should be in velocities, right? So this is something like this, which you can write as mv minus mu, right? And that's the change in momentum. But you have to also remember in this thing that momentum uh, or velocity is a vector quantity. So when it hits the ground, it hits it with velocity in this direction. And when it, after hitting the ground, it is going to rebound back upwards with so this is, let's call this u, let's call this v. So the direction of the velocity changes. So we have to include for this direction of the velocity, right? And so we do that by saying that if, if I say that this, one of these velocities is positive and the other one is negative, right? So let's say that this one is positive and this one is negative. One of these directions is negative and the other one is positive. So if this is negative, the final velocity, that means that for m, which was 0 0.059 kilograms, and then for velocities, I just use this thing, that final velocity is minus 5.4 meters per second, right? Minus sign because it's upwards and we say that it's negative. And this minus sign comes from the fact that it's change in momentum. And then you have 0 0.05 kilograms again, multiplied by the initial velocity which is downwards and it's positive and the initial velocity remember was 8.7 meters per second now you just do the math and this gives you a result as minus 0 0.832 newtons seconds as momentum but remember they're saying calculate the chain uh, the the magnitude of the change in momentum magnitude means that get rid of this signature right so this just take the absolute of this which means that it would just make this positive as 0 0.832 newton seconds so you'll write here positive 0 0.832 newtons second as the change in momentum next part determine the magnitude of the average resultant force that acts on the ball during the collision so we have to figure out what is the average resultant force which is acting on our uh, ball when the collision happens now we know that the momentum or basically the force is really defined as the time rate of change of momentum so if momentum changes that means there's some force causing that change right because when momentum changes, what is basically changing is velocity, right? Because it is mass times velocity. And so if this thing, dv by dt, is just acceleration. So the average resultant force is then change in momentum by divided by change in time. The, this delta t is just the time of contact which was if you remember 0 0.091 seconds and the change in momentum which we computed was 0 0.832 newtons per second newton seconds sorry so this cancels out and this gives you the math as 9.14 newtons so that's the average resultant force acting on the ball during the collision 9.14 newtons now, part three, we have that use your answer in C part two to calculate the magnitude of the average force exerted by the ground on the ball during the collision, right? So the force that is exerted by the ground on the ball, so by ground on the ball, should be equal because of Newton's third law to force exerted by ball on the ground, which just means that this should be equal to the force that we computed, the average resultant force when it hits the ground, 
plus the weight of the ball which is also in downwards direction and this would be then the average force exerted by the ground on the ball during the collision so that's f 9.14 newtons plus the weight weight we can figure it out by multiplying the mass which was 0.059 kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared and doing the math gives you this average force as 9.72 newtons right so it's 9.72 newtons now part d states that the ball was thrown downwards at time t equals zero and hits the ground at time t equals t on this figure 2.2 where we have speed versus time graph sketch a graph to show the variation of speed of the ball with the time t from t equals 0 to t equals t and t equals t is the time when it hits the ground uh, numerical values are not allowed so you just have to draw a graph now remember our problem statement the ball was released with some initial speed so initial speed is not zero there is some initial speed on the ball right and then it hits the ground at time t equals t capital t where its speed is again 8.7 meters per second so its speed is not zero speed is increasing because of the gravity right and so if i go back to the graph i have to sketch this graph for variation of speed of the ball with time t from zero to capital t and numerical values are not allowed so the graph should not start from zero the line will not start from zero it will start from some higher point which is the value for u basically right and then it's falling under a constant force or a, or a constant acceleration so the speed is increasing at a constant rate right so it should be a straight line now it is going to increase to this rate up until time t where this value for speed is the final velocity with which it hits the ground which was 8.7 meters per second so that's the graph that we were required to sketch. Now, they're saying that in practice, air resistance is not negligible. As I just talked about air resistance, it makes sense. It's not negligible. There are air molecules present everywhere. So state and explain the variation, if any, with time t of the gradient of the graph in part d, which was this one, when air resistance is not negligible. So if it's falling, right, and it has to hit the ground, if the if there is no air resistance then the only force that is acting is its weight right and that and that force is a constant force so there's constant acceleration on it but if now there is some air resistance in the other direction then there is some acceleration and deceleration is also happening so the eventually the speed of the ball it starts to increase but then because of the as the speed increases and increases the air resistance becomes stronger and stronger and when that happens eventually the velocity starts to decrease right so the, the graph if we were to draw it, it should look like a curve slope downwards, right? So first it starts to increase like this, and then the curve slopes downwards, something uh, like this, right? It's uh, not very crystal clear, so I'll try to do it again. Something like this, right? Where this is the velocity and this is the time t. Now, in words, as I just explained, as air resistance, I'll write AR for air resistance, uh, increases with the increase in velocity of the object right and if this air resistance increases so the resultant force resultant so the important thing is resultant force will decrease and if the resultant force decreases obviously the acceleration from it also decreases and hence the gradient is downwards right so the slope uh, of this line or the gradient of this curve is sloped downwards or a decreasing gradient right 